All right, now we talked about latent heat. We've heard, used these words before when we were talking about how the jet stream can transport energy from equatorial areas to more northerly areas. The jet stream could carry a moisture-laden air mass from an equatorial area to a more mid-latitude or even polar area, okay? um, and that moisture-laden air mass will have a lot of water vapor in it. Well, water vapor represents a lot of potential or stored thermal energy, okay? Because it takes a lot of energy to turn wa liquid water into a vapor, okay? And so that vapor is now essentially just a, a battery, okay, if you will, that's pulling all this thermal energy with it and carrying it somewhere else, okay? When that moisture, that water vapor condenses, the energy that it had stored as a result of being a vapor is then released as sensible heat. Okay? So it's a way to transport energy without it being actual hot air. Okay? It's just moisture that holds a lot of potential thermal energy. Okay? When it gets to that new area and the precipitation happens, the condensation occurs, the energy that was stored in the vapor gets released. Okay? And we're talking about loads and loads of energy. Okay? To give you an idea, and I think I told you this number before, for every gram of water okay, to evaporate, requires 2,260 joules of energy for every gram, okay? One gram of water is one milliliter, okay? So if you have a can of hop, that's 355 milliliters. Now you think about how many liters of water falls out of a storm, okay? That's a lot of energy, okay? Lots and lots and lots. Because we're talking about a storm, when a storm happens, we're talking about millions of liters of water. Okay, um, and so that's a lot of stored energy, okay? and that's why we're saying latent heat, other than convection, is probably the next biggest way that energy gets transported on Earth. Yeah, question. So this energy gets released when water condenses. Correct. Exactly. So yeah. why is it colder sometimes when it rains? Only because the sun is blocked. But yes, there is, and during the process of the building, like for a thunderstorm, we're talking about the water is likely evaporating from nearby, and that actually takes energy, right? But when it recondenses, it gives off energy. It's part of the reason why there's you know, the static electricity that causes lightning is also part of that energy. It's all energy that's in the cloud, okay? And again, that condensation is happening at a high altitude, not at ground level, right? So we're feeling the cold water coming down. We're feeling that water hitting us and then evaporating. When the water evaporates, that takes energy. That's how sweat works. We're going to talk about that in a minute, too. Okay? So we feel cooler. It doesn't mean that energy is not being added. Energy is still being added to the area, but we may not feel it at ground level because the condensation is actually happening at altitude. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Sorry, I got my boards out of alignment here. So let me realign it. I was noticing my marker was not right. Okay. Uh, so latent heat happens whenever water or any material changes state, okay? Latent heat represents thermal potential energy, okay? Changing the temperature of something, which is what we were talking about the other day with specific heat capacity, involves changing the kinetic thermal energy of a material, okay? Here's the difference. When we change the kinetic thermal energy of a material, all we do is make the particles move faster, okay? So when you heat something up and the temperature goes up, Okay, according to the particle theory, okay, the particles just start moving faster. Okay, they're faster and faster and faster. When something changes state, the particles don't move faster, they move apart. Okay, so when ice melts, and, uh, and ice is kind of an exception to it because ice, they're actually further apart because of the polar nature of water. But any other material, okay, in its solid form, okay, the particles are really close together. So they move, they move really fast, they're running into each other a lot, and then suddenly it reaches its melting point and the particles just go like this, and they move apart, okay? That's why the liquid version of pretty much everything but water takes up more space than its solid counterpart does, okay? And then, once you've got a liquid, okay, now the particles can start moving even faster because there's more space in between them. They can move around each other, okay? All those kinds of things, and if we continue to heat it, okay, not only do the particles move faster, but once we get to the boiling point of that material, they'll move farther apart again, okay? And now they'll become a gas. Okay? But every time you pull those particles further apart, that requires way more energy than it does to just make them move faster. A change in kinetic thermal energy is nothing. 
compared to a change in potential thermal energy. And that's why we see the heating curve of water okay, looking like this picture here. Okay, so this is what happens when you add energy to water. Okay, so starting at minus 25, obviously the water is ice. Okay, if we add energy to it. We don't have to add very much. So on the on the x-axis here is the amount of heat being added. Okay, and then on the y-axis is temperature. So we don't have to add very much energy for ice. Whoop. So when we heat up ice, when we add only this much energy, we change the temperature of the ice by quite a bit, by 25 degrees Celsius. It doesn't take very much energy to change the temperature of ice. Okay? Ice actually has a fairly low heat capacity. Okay? We talked about heat capacities the other day, right? Okay? The heat capacity of ice is 2.116 joules per gram degree Celsius. For liquid water, it's 4.2 joules per gram degree Celsius. Again, water being weird, it has a different heat capacity for each state. Most materials are not like that. Okay? And then for steam, it's 2.02 .02 joules per gram degree Celsius. So we don't need much heat to change the temperature of the ice. But then, the temperature stops changing. Once it gets to zero, the temperature flatlines, but we keep adding energy. Right? What's happening there? What happens to ice at zero? It starts to melt. Exactly. Okay. While the particles are moving further apart, they cannot move faster. Okay. The, the maximum speed at which a particle can move is determined by its state. Once they get to their maximum speed, that's when the state changes. Okay. So I can't see a change in kinetic thermal energy, which we measure with temperature, until the state has completely changed. Okay. So the ice has to melt. So while ice is melting, its temperature will not change. Right? Uh, you can try this at home if you have a thermometer. Okay? Just take a bunch of ice, put it in a glass, okay? then add water, okay? so it's kind of just covering all the ice. And then just keep stirring it. Okay? And you'll see with the thermometer that that ice, the whole mixture, will not change temperature until all the ice is gone. Okay? It's funky, but cool. Okay? And it's result. Same is true at the boiling point. Right? So once I've melted the ice, I keep adding heat, temperature of the water is going to go up. But again, you'll see that this is not a big part of the, of the graph. Okay? Like we've got this very small part of the graph here where we're changing the temperature of ice. This fairly small part of the graph, okay? it's about the same, maybe a little less than the melting. And then when we get to boiling, look how much energy we have to add in order to vaporize the water. It's the bulk of the graph. Okay? And that's because it requires a huge amount of energy to vaporize water. And again, that's why latent heat is such a good energy transfer mechanism on a global scale. Okay? Once we get all that water to evaporate at 100 degrees Celsius, okay, then the temperature of the steam will start to go up again. Okay? But it won't change until all the water is boiled off. Right? Like, again, you can try this with the same thermometer that you try the ice melting thing, except be careful because it's hot water. Okay. Um, you put the thermometer in there, it won't, it'll stay at 100 degrees until, well, it'll only stay at 100 degrees because you, you can't capture the steam and, <laughs> and the steam will go away. Unless you have a pressure cooker. Okay. The whole idea behind a pressure cooker is that if you put the water under pressure, it won't evaporate and you can actually superheat the water. Then okay. you can get it above 100 degrees Celsius and that helps to cook things faster. That's the principle behind the pressure cooker. Okay. Um, can you have liquid water exist below zero degrees Celsius? Actually, you can. Okay? You can super cool water. You can get it down really, really cold. As long as you don't allow the crystallization process to happen, you have to have basically perfectly pure distilled water. 
Okay? If there's anything in there, that can start the crystallization process. Okay? I had a prof in, uh, in university who showed us this one time. He brought in this big container okay, that was filled with liquid nitrogen. Okay? So it kept, it was like minus 40 something inside the container. And inside the container was a beaker of liquid water. Okay? So he put on these special gloves okay? and he pulled out the, the uh, beaker and he set it down really, really gently on the table. Because if he'd have put it down and jiggled it at all, like, like made a disturbance, it would have flashed for him, okay? like immediately. Right? So he's got this super cool water, minus 40 degrees. And he takes a pinch of salt and just goes like this. And it's at the second, the first salt crystal hit the water, it flashed those broke the beaker. And there was, a piece, there was a chunk of frozen water. Okay? Just by sitting on the counter. Right? It was so cold, but he hadn't allowed the crystallization process to happen, so it just poof, really quick. I actually got a video of something like that. You may have seen this, I don't know if anyone's ever done this, but if you put a bottle of like, like really pure kind of reverse osmosis water in the freezer, okay, for a little while, you, if you pull it up, sometimes it's not frozen, but if you jiggle it, it just freezes. It's much funnier when you hear the soundtrack for it because I'll turn the speaker on. Okay. okay, now I can't record that. All right, so the heating curve of water works like this. Anywhere the line is going up, okay, it's, or it's diagonal, then kinetic thermal energy is changing, and we can calculate the amount of kinetic thermal ener the energy that is changing using the formula we used last week, E equals mc delta P. Okay, because it's got temperature change in it, right? It can calculate the, the kinetic thermal energy change at any part of the graph that's diagonal, okay? But it won't work for the horizontal parts of the graph, because what's not changing there? Temperature, if I try and use that formula, it's gonna tell me zero. Well, obviously that's not true. I've got a pot of water on the stove and I'm adding heat to it. There's definitely energy changing there, okay? And that's when we have to use our latent heat formulas, which are even easier than this one, okay? Trust me, this is easy. Okay, so we're gonna have a look at those. All right, so latent heat, okay, is the amount of heat that's involved in a state change. It's hidden heat, okay, since the energy involved does not result in a change in temperature. And there's two kinds, specific latent heat of fusion, which is what happens when the object is melting or freezing, okay, and specific latent heat of vaporization, which is happening when it condenses or um, evaporates, okay, one or the other. All right, so we'll talk about latent heat of fusion first, okay? And that's what happens again at melting or freezing. Now, if I was going to go, let's say, you know, out for a picnic or a camping trip or something like that, and I wanted to keep some drinks cold in a cooler, do I fill that cooler full of cold water or ice? Ice, common sense, right? Definitely, I would use ice. Okay, why would I use ice? Well, because of this graph, okay? the graph we were looking at just a minute ago. It makes way more sense to use ice because ice can absorb more energy than the water can because it's at a lower total thermal energy point than the liquid water would be. Okay? If I fill the cooler with liquid water, even if that liquid water is at zero degrees Celsius, I'm starting here on this graph. And all that can happen is for the water to warm up. Okay? That's not going to do me much good. It's not going to keep my, my drinks cold for very long. Okay? If I start with ice straight from my freezer, I'm starting down here on the graph instead. Okay? So now, not only do I have to make the ice change temperature, which will take a little bit of, of energy, right? I've got to heat it to melting. Okay? Then I've got all this energy that the ice can absorb while it changes state from solid to liquid. So obviously I want to fill my cooler with ice because it can absorb more heat and keep my drinks cold longer. Everybody okay with that idea? That's, that's the scientific reasoning behind something that's, well, brutally obvious. Okay? Nobody would go, whoa, I'll take my cooler and put it under the sink. Nobody would do that. Okay? You would obviously fill it with ice. That's what you do. Okay. So for melting and freezing, the specific heat of fusion for water, and we're only ever gonna do this for water, 
is 333 joules per gram. Okay? So if I have a gram of ice, which would be about one milliliter of ice, okay, it would take 333 joules of energy to melt it okay, at already at zero degrees Celsius. Okay? If it was colder than zero, I would first have to warm it to melting and then it would melt. Right? And this is what happens when you make a snowball with your bare hands. Right? That's going to be several grams worth of water. Okay? When you take a you know, chunk of snow and you're, and you're building it up, that's probably 50, maybe 100 mils worth of water okay? uh, when, you're, when you're doing that. Okay? If you're making that snowball, you're probably melting 10 mils of it in your hands. Okay? Well, that's 3,000 joules worth of thermal energy that your hands are going to lose in that process. Okay? That's why your hands get so cold when you make a snowball with your bare hands. Okay? It takes a lot of energy to change the state of ice. Right? Everybody good with that? Okay. All right, so the formula is E equals M times LF. Okay, LF is the 333 mass in grams. All right, so you've given those numbers. You're never going to have to manipulate that formula. You're only ever going to use it to calculate E. That's it. Okay. All right, questions on latent heat of fusion? Are you good with that? Okay. Now, the amount of energy required to vaporize one gram of a substance is latent heat of vaporization. For water, as we were saying before, that's 2,260 joules per gram. Right? So that same gram of snow that you melted in your hand, okay, you've now heated to boiling, obviously not in your hand, okay? and now it's going to evaporate. Okay? Now, water obviously doesn't have to be at 100 degrees Celsius to evaporate. Okay? You can evaporate at basically any temperature. Every time it evaporates, for every gram, 2,260 joules worth of energy will be required. Okay? This is why sweat works. Okay? You get hot, you sweat, you get those beads of perspiration, okay? and, and you, start to that, you start to feel cooler. Okay? You start to feel cooler because the energy to evaporate that water is coming from your body. Right? For every gram of that water that evaporates, your body's going to lose around 2,000 joules worth of energy. Okay? That can cool you pretty quickly. It's the same reason why when you get out of the shower, you start to feel chilled almost immediately because the water that's on your body starts to evaporate very quickly. Okay? Now, in the summertime, when it gets really, really hot, okay? this is counterintuitive, but you start sweating. Is it better to sit down and just stay put? Move around. Move around. Okay? By moving around, you increase the rate at which air is circulating past your skin, which helps to increase the speed at which things will, uh, water will evaporate, which will help to cool you off. Why, why you sit in front of a fan? Okay? Having the air go by you makes the water evaporate, the sweat evaporate more quickly. Okay? It helps to cool you faster. Okay? The fan doesn't make the air cooler. Okay? It just circulates it, which increases the rate of evaporation, which helps you to feel cooler. It's the same reason why we have wind chill. Right? So on those really cold days, they say it's, you know, it's minus 30, but with the wind chill, it's minus 40. Okay? Wind chill happens because the moisture in your skin evaporates in the cold wind. Even though it's well below zero, okay? the moisture in your hands starts to evaporate, and that increases the rate at which you lose heat. Okay? And that's what can lead to frostbite. Right? That's why you wouldn't go outside with wet hair when it's minus 30. Okay? You get cold in a hurry. Not because, I mean, your hair would probably eventually freeze, but before it froze, some of it would evaporate, okay, and, and make you cooler, right? It's also why um, we want to always dress in layers. If we're going to be going outside when it's cold, but we're going to be physically active, okay? If we just throw on our big winter coat, we're going to start to sweat, and then as soon as we stop being active, we've got all this moisture that has to evaporate. When it evaporates, we're going to get really cold, and you're going to get chilled. Okay? That's why it's better to dress in layers, and as you start to heat up, you take those layers off, okay? and then they don't get wet. Right? You can put on dry layers when, you see, when you're less active, okay? and then you roll, you know, or you can take off the wet layer and put on the dry layers or whatever, okay? but you can keep yourself from getting chilled by not having so much moisture available to evaporate. Okay? Everybody all right with that idea? Okay? So there's, th That's kind of the scientific reasoning behind why we do some of the things we all right, so we were saying here that to melt takes 333 joules per gram. That's why this is a much smaller portion of the graph than the evaporation part is, okay? It requires a lot more energy to evaporate that amount of water that I started with. All right. 
Questions on that? Okay, so we're going to kind of look at some of the problem solving that we're going to have to do here with the latent teaching stuff. So I want you to copy that problem down okay, in your notes. You're going to be meant to do that. And I'm going to walk you through how we solve it. Okay, so give me a minute to get that one on down. So if a question starts out with how much energy is required and it's talking about water being in more than one state, you know it's not a specific heat capacity question. You're going to have to use the specific heat capacity formula in it, but it's going to have more than one step. Okay? If the question says, you know, um, somebody puts on a ring made out of gold and the temperature goes up by this much, well, obviously the gold's not melting or evaporating. Okay? It's just going to change temperature. That's just a specific heat capacity question. But in this, it's talking about ice, and then it's talking about steam. It's talking about several different states of a material. Okay? If it does that, then we know we're talking about the heating curve of water. Okay? So the first thing I do is I actually draw just a quick diagram, not, without, not with the, you know, the axes and everything. I just draw the shape. Okay? The reason I draw the shape is so that I can figure out how many steps there are to this question. Okay? So this question says that I start with 250 grams of ice, so they do tell me the mass, 250 grams, okay, at minus 15. Well, here's melting, here's boiling, and I know I didn't draw it to scale because the scale is not important. Okay, so this would be minus 15, this would be zero. Okay, this would be you know between zero and 100, this would be 100, and then this would be above 100. Right, so I'm going into steam at 150 degrees. Right, so I've got to do the whole curve here basically. How many steps am I looking at? Five steps. There's three places where temperature changes, so three steps with E equals MC delta T, but there's also two state changes where temperature doesn't change. All right, so I've got first, my first step is I have to heat the ice from minus 15 to zero. My second step is that I have to melt the ice. My third step is I have to heat the water from zero to 100 degrees. My fourth step, I have to evaporate all that water. And then my fifth step is I have to heat the steam from 100 to 150 degrees. Okay? So there's actually five steps here. Right? Five different, very easy calculations. Right? So here's what I have to do. Now that I've figured out how many steps there are, I need to determine what each one of those steps is. Step one, am I changing kinetic thermal energy or potential thermal energy? I'm making the ice warm up. I'm not melting it, I'm making it warm up. Is that a change in kinetic thermal energy or potential thermal energy? Kinetic, okay? Because kinetic thermal energy is measured by temperature, and in this part of the graph, the line's going up, so temperature is changing. That means I have to use the formula that calculates energy using temperature change, E equals MC delta T. Okay. In my next step, I have no temperature change. Okay. It's going to stay at zero the, the entire time, and it's going to change state from liquid to gas. That means I'm going to have to use the formula that involves the latent heat of fusion. E equals MLF. Okay, with LF being 333 joules per gram. Okay. All right, when I get to step three, am I changing? So, in, sorry, in step two, I was changing potential thermal energy because I wasn't changing temperature. Okay, in step three, I'm changing temperature again. So, which formula am I going to use? E equals MC delta T again. Anywhere where the line goes up, we're changing kinetic thermal energy, thus temperature, thus E equals MC delta T. All right, step four, now I'm dealing with the latent heat of vaporization. I forgot to tell you about this formula, but E equals MLV for this part, okay? Because now it's not fusion, it's vaporization. So we got E equals MLV because we're changing the potential thermal energy of the water again by changing its state. Okay, then what formula do we use in step five? 
is e delta d. Temperature is going up again. Anywhere where temperature goes up, we use the temperature change formula. Okay, so I don't have to do any manipulating. I just have to plug numbers in here. Okay, what's the mass? 250 grams. That doesn't change, okay? If I have 250 grams of ice and I melt it, I have 250 grams of water. 250 grams of ice has the same number of water molecules in it as 250 grams of water. Their volumes are different because their densities are different, okay? But they have the same number of particles. So melting ice does not change its mass, okay? It's just as many water molecules when it's melted. Same with steam, okay? That steam would still have a mass of 250 grams. There's just as many water molecules in the steam as in the ice cube I started with. Okay. All right, so I'm going to go M, 250 grams, and then I need the specific heat capacity of ice, which is on your, in your digital workbook, but I won't make you look it up. 2.116 joules per gram degree Celsius. Okay. And how much am I changing the temperature of the ice by? 15 degrees. There's the first mistake people make. Okay. They put in the entire temperature change. 165 degrees. Last time I checked, ice does not exist past zero. Okay, I'm certainly not going to change the temperature of the ice 165 degrees unless I started at minus 170. Okay, that wasn't going to happen. I'm changing the ice from minus 15 to zero, and that's it. Okay, that's again why we draw this graph. Okay, I know the temperature change here is only 15 degrees Celsius. All right, so I've got my first formula there. Okay, punch that into my calculator and get my number. So 250 times 2.116 times 15 degrees. All right, 7,935 joules. All right, so that's step one. In step two, I'm using E equals M times LF. I know LF is 333 joules per gram. And the mass is still 250. All right, 83,250 joules. Okay. Quite a bit more energy to melt that ice than it was to warm it up. All right, in step three, I'm going to use E equals MC delta T. Mass is still 250 grams. What C do I use now? Liquid water, right, okay. That's 4.2 joules per gram, okay. And then how much am I changing the temperature by? 100, right, I'm going from zero to 100. I'm changing the temperature by 100 degrees. Okay, 105,000 joules. Okay, it's actually a little bit more than it was to melt the ice, but I also changed the temperature by 100 degrees, like a big temperature change. Okay, in step four, okay, E equals M times LV. So still 250 grams, but now I'm using LV, which is 2,260 joules per gram. All right, so this is going to be a big number. This is the biggest part of our curve. So um, 250 times 2260. All right, it's over half a million joules. Okay, and this is one cup. 250 grams is one cup of water. Okay, so we're not talking about a lot here. Okay, so 565,000 joules. Okay. Last step. Still have 250 grams of steam now. Okay. Times the specific heat capacity of steam, so 2.02, .02, times the temperature change. How much am I changing the temperature by here? 50. Yeah, I'm going from 100 to 150.
25,250 joules. All right, so now I've got the energy for each step. The question wants to know how much energy it took to do the whole thing. What do I do with all those numbers? Add them up. Okay, was there anything mathematically challenging here? Not really, you just have to remember some numbers, and all of those numbers will be on your formula sheet, okay, or given to you on the test, okay, one or the other, okay, so you won't have to worry about memorizing any of those. So we'll take all of those numbers, okay, so our 7935 uh, plus our um, 83,250 uh, plus 105,000 plus uh, 565,000 plus 2, Okay, so we are looking at 786,435 joules. Okay, and 565,000 of that was to evaporate it. Okay, so most of that energy was used in the evaporation process. Again, I know I've said this like five times today, but that's why latent heat is such a big energy transfer mechanism. Could you like you quantify that number in a way that makes more sense than just a number? Like, like to compare it to something. A blowtorch running for All right, questions on how that worked? Now, I probably wouldn't give you a five-step one on a test. I'd probably give you like a three-step one okay, on the test, but you would still have to be able to start it out. Sorry, Luke, what's uh, In step two and four, yeah. you get uh, 333. Oh, they're the, they're the numbers from, from the sheet, okay? Oh. So this is how much energy water takes to, uh, to melt, or ice takes to melt, okay, per gram, and this is how much energy liquid water takes to evaporate per gram. All right, so what you would have to do step by step here is just what we did. Mark your steps. Mark your starting point and ending point. Identify what your steps are. Do your calculations. Add all the energies together, and you're done. Okay? So it's not a really like mathematically challenging type of problem, but it's worth a lot of marks. Okay? So this is one of the questions on your test that's an opportunity to really um, weight your score. Okay? because there's really nothing terribly difficult about it, but because there's so many steps, it could be a six or seven mark question, okay? even though there's nothing really tough about it. Right? So um, know that you are gonna have one of these on your unit exam, not the one on Wednesday, but the one on Monday. Okay? Um, and it'll be like this, except it'll probably only be three steps instead of five. All right. So I want you guys to give these questions a try. So we've talked about the ice cubes. You just write your own, write that in your own words. We've talked about the sweat. You can kind of write that in your own words, okay? Uh, and then think about um, these two questions. Number four, we kind of already talked about as well. Okay, think about number three. Think about why that might work, right? And then there's some calculating to do after that. The answers are on there. These same questions are also in the digital workbook if it's too small for you to read there, okay? You can call it up on your phone. I'll read it from there. But I'm going to give you a little bit of time and then I'm going to go through these uh, explanatory questions first and then we'll start going through the problems together as well. Okay, so we'll be doing that today. We'll be doing uh, probably biomes tomorrow, your unit exam on Wednesday, okay, uh, unit exam review on Thursday. Okay, we'll go over your physics test and then do a unit exam review for this unit on Thursday. Friday, we'll probably talk a bit about your final exam. Monday, you'll have um, your unit exam for unit four. And on Tuesday, we'll go over that unit exam and do whatever other 
final exam review stuff we can put into that class. Okay, and uh, we'll do that. All right. Okay, so you got some time to work on that, and then we'll go over a few of those together. All right, so question number one. Why does putting ice cubes in your drink make your drink cold? Think laws of thermodynamics here. Second law of thermodynamics says energy flows from hot to cold. Well, your drink is hot. The ice is cold. Okay? I mean, your drink, which is a liquid, cannot be colder than zero degrees Celsius. The ice is zero degrees Celsius, and it's still in a solid form, which means it's lower energy than the liquid it's sitting in. So the energy from the liquid goes into the ice. The good news about that is, is that it brings down the temperature of the liquid, and the ice can hold it near zero degrees Celsius. It's not going to be exactly zero. It'll be like four, three, four, somewhere in there. Okay, But it's going to hold it there until the ice is gone. Once the ice is gone, the drink's going to start getting warm pretty fast. Okay, does that make sense? So it's a law of thermodynamics type of thing. Okay, our bodies naturally sweat. Why does this cool us? Okay, well, we talked about how to evaporate water requires a lot of energy. So if your body is covered in a thin film of water and it starts to evaporate, you're going to naturally feel cooler because the energy for that evaporation is being supplied by your body. Okay? Now, if you think about this, our body is a whole bunch of things to try and maximize the effectiveness of sweat. Okay? When you start to sweat, what happens to your skin besides to get wet and sticky? If you're especially fair, this is more obvious. Oh, no. no I didn't mean that. Yes, you will start to smell. But you get flushed. You ever notice when you start to get hot, your skin kind of gets flushed, right? It turns red, okay? And that's because your, your body starts directing blood into the capillaries that are near the surface so that blood can be cooled more quickly by the, by the sweat, okay? So you start getting flushed so that there's all this blood flow near the surface. That blood can be cooled quickly by the evaporating sweat, okay? And it makes it more effective, right? If you have a cold sweat, okay, which can sometimes happen if you're really anxious or you're in shock, okay? The flushing response doesn't happen. You sweat, but the flushing response doesn't happen, and you're clammy and cold. Okay, and in that case, it can actually make you shake and and, and stuff like that. Okay, uh, so you, you wouldn't want that. Now, does everybody sweat the same? No. Like some people perspire and they get this tiny little like little beads, you know, and, and, and that works just fine. And then there's other people that sweat buckets. Okay, and I mean it literally. Some people do sweat buckets. Okay. Um, does that mean that they're going to cool themselves any more effectively than someone who just perspires? Okay. There's nothing saying that sweating buckets is going to cool you better than perspiring. In fact, it may be the opposite. Right? If you're sweating and sweating and sweating, you may get such a layer of water on your skin that it becomes ineffective and you're just dripping. Okay? Any sweat that drips off of you is not doing its job. Okay? It's a waste. Right? Anybody know people that, that sweat buckets? Okay. That's kind of gross. Especially if you're playing sports. Yeah. And I knew a guy who was on my basketball team in high school, and the guy, like, he couldn't wear his jersey during warm up, or he would have to wring it out. Okay? Like, the guy just, and if you had to be in the drill against him, he'd slide off of him all the time. But he, he, he couldn't be on the skin team. Okay? Not, to, not, to, <laughs> not that you play that way anymore. But, hey, back in the day, we did that. And if he was on the skins team, you couldn't guard him because he'd slide off you. He was just slimy. Okay? Um, but yeah, it, some people do sweat a lot more. Um, years ago, uh, the Oilers had a goaltender named Nikolai Habibulin. Okay, this guy sweat buckets. All right, they actually caught he he drilled holes in his skates to drain the water out. Okay, and they caught it on the on the goal cam one time. You know the one that's like down at the bottom of the goal, and they caught and you could see water dripping out of his skates onto the ice, okay? This is a guy who every time there's a whistle, skates to the bench for a new blocker and a new mitt because they're soaking wet. They had a thing behind the bench to dry them out, like a fan with tubes, you know, that they'd stick them on, okay? And they would dry them out. That's why the Oilers were no good in a shootout when he was there. Because by the time the shootout came, the guy had lost 10 pounds in water and he was cramping up and, okay? Everybody knew if you got into a shootout with the Oilers with happy bull and you were gonna win because the guy was dehydrated by then, okay? Doesn't mean he cooled himself any better. He just sweat buckets. 
Okay, maybe by the end of the game, there'd be a little ridge in front of the net made out of this sweat ice, but I don't know, like, yeah, some guys just sweat more than others, and it's just, yeah, it doesn't mean it cools you any better. Okay, uh, question number three. Gardeners often spray their crops before a frost, and I don't mean spray like with pesticides, I mean they actually spray it with water, and they get a thin film of water around the fruit. Okay, then it freezes. Now, that film of water freezes. And what happens when water freezes? Does that take energy or give it off? It gives it off. Where does that energy go? Into the fruit. Keeps the fruit from freezing. Okay? And now, this can't be a hard freeze. If it's going to drop below minus five, this isn't going to work. Okay? But if it's going to be a light frost, it could save the tomatoes or the apples or whatever it is okay? uh, from, uh, from freeze damage. Okay? So they'll just coat them in a thin film of water okay, by turning on their irrigation okay, for a little bit before the freeze. All right. Um, and then, sorry, we'll look at number four as well, because well, we already talked about that. Why do you put ice in instead of water? The ice can do what? Yeah, it can absorb more energy. Remember, okay, on our heating curve of water, okay, this first flat line here is zero degrees Celsius. Okay, if I put ice in that's zero degrees, I'm starting here. If I put water in that's zero degrees, I'm starting here. I lose this whole part of the graph. Okay, if I just put in water at zero degrees Celsius, the water is just going to warm up. The ice has to melt before it warms up, so it's capable of, of absorbing more total thermal energy because it has to change state before it can warm. Okay, keep going there, guys. I'll go through some of the problem solving here in a little bit. And okay, let's say number, uh, let's say five, how much heat is given off when two kilograms of water freezes? Well, how many grams is two thousand? Is 2,000 grams, just gave it away. 2,000, okay, and we're freezing into ice at, at zero degrees. Well, that means going from here to here. Well, that's only one step, okay? So all I have to do is go 2,000 times 333, which is how I get that number. How much heat has changed? Uh, is needed to change 0 0.06 kilograms of water. Well, that's 60 grams. Add 100 degrees into steam at 100. Well, that's start here, end here. That's only one step. Okay, multiply that by 2,260, and you've got your answer. Okay, seven would be uh, two steps, okay, because we'd be starting at minus 20, and it's going to be fully melted when we're done, right? So that's warm the ice, melt the ice, that's two steps, right? So that would be an E equals MC delta T calculation, okay, and then an E equals MLF calculation. We'll probably work on that still a little bit more tomorrow before I start into biomes, okay? Because we have to first heat it and then melt it, yeah? Okay, I'm gonna come around with the soap. If everybody can just jump up and down, take it out, please.
every class, oh, the second that's the second that's 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 that we started, so I tried to that's 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 that's